Thank you very much for coming along. Today we consider the question, what have we learned from this global virus about the future of food, food systems, and the human prospect in a post-COVID world? In recent weeks, we've begun to enumerate different aspects of the long-term social impact of the global COVID crisis in one realm after another. These and other related discussions can be shared through a collective playlist on YouTube at transition-studies.tv under the playlist entitled The Social Impact of COVID-19. The playlist has highlighted, for example, the pandemic's potential impact on education, asking, what have we learned from this virus about the coming transformation of education systems worldwide? Further, it discussed the potential social impact on public consciousness because of the measures now being taken to manage information. In addition, it touched upon the ways in which the COVID-19 crisis has revealed the vulnerability of the current global food system, asking, what have, we, what have we learned from this global virus about the vulnerability of the global food system and the strategies needed for a sustainable recovery? Today, we would like to broaden and deepen that discussion by examining in greater detail the future of food, food systems, and the human prospect in the post-COVID world. The first step in examining the future of food is to understand where our current global food system came from and how it has evolved with particularly vulnerable characteristics. After 1492, the global food system evolved through several different phases, including royal trade, marked by European quest for high value to weight ratio items, like the spice trade, gold, gems, ivory, things that were very valuable, even though they didn't weigh necessarily very much. Beyond the royal trade, there was the Atlantic plantation system, which emerged after it and as a result of it, involving the development of capitalist plantation agriculture in the New World and what's called the prior plantation system in Africa. There were plantations set up in Africa to fuel the slave trade, to provide food for the tens of thousands, indeed millions, of people transported across the Atlantic. This is slave-powered agriculture on both sides of the Atlantic, and it's known as the Atlantic Plantation System, both because of its scope in Africa and its scope in the New World. And of course, after the slave trade, or after the slave trade diminished in the 19th century, there was the replacement of the slave trade by legitimate commerce and the reorganization of agriculture around the export of what were known as cash crops. The historical origins, evolution, and future dimensions of Africa's recurrent food crises are wrapped up in this history of the emergence of a global food system, and it has to be understood in that context. And New World crops had been introduced into Africa to fuel the slave trade, for example, maize, 
a very good study by James McCann over at Boston University has made this very clear. In this sense, plantations in the Americas depended upon the prior plantations in Africa of different kinds of foodstuffs introduced from the New World into Africa to provide the nourishment for the slave trade itself, but also to test slaves before being transported as to whether they could tolerate and thrive upon New World foodstuffs. We need to look at all of Africa's food history in this respect and look particularly at the recent famines of the decades since the 1960s. Several studies have been done that, on this, but we must examine the impact of more modern agricultural experimentation in Africa to understand these periodic famines. The transformation of modern agriculture was not limited, obviously, to the global south. <clears throat> it started with a massive mechanization of agriculture in the global north. Here you can see examples of the wheat crop being harvested by what might be called an energy source based on current photosynthate. That is to say, horses and mules had to be fed, and they had to be fed with grain that was captured by photosynthesis. So it was captured roughly simultaneously, or the year before, it was consumed by these horses or mules who were the main source of mechanizing agriculture in the first instance. But in the middle of the 20th century, what became known as farm technological progress took a, an amazingly fast pace. Techniques for the harvest of grain increased production on farms that could use tractors. In doing so, fossil fuels replaced manpower in these instances. But some conditions for agricultural field workers who harvested fruits and vegetables in particular had not improved at all from the days of slavery. CBS did a report on this in 1960, headed up by Edward R. Murrow, entitled Harvest of Shame. It's a pretty staggering report and an indictment of American field agriculture in 1960. Over here, seventy cents. Over here, seventy cents. Over here, seventy cents today. We're paying today. We're paying more in the buying town. Seventy cents, seventy cents today. Seventy cents today. Seventy cents. Seventy cents. I want that job. Oh, I can do the magic. Eight selling box in Uganda. You, if you pull today, and we pull what we got to pull today, you'll have eleven dollars in your pocket. This is not taking place in the Congo. It has nothing to do with Johannesburg or Cape Town. It is not Nyasaland or Nigeria. This is Florida. These are citizens of the United States, 1960. This is a shape up for migrant workers. The hawkers are chanting the going peace rate at the various fields. This is the way the humans who harvest the food for the best fed people in the world get hired. One farmer looked at this and said, we used to own our slaves, now we just rent them. The Secretary of Labor looked at the migrant plight and said, I think they're the great mass of what I've called uh, the excluded Americans. They are people who cry out, the workers and their children and their wives, who cry out for some assistance and uh, whose uh, plight is a shame. It's a shame in America. The president of the American Farm Bureau Federation, the largest farmers organization, says, 
I think that uh, most uh, social workers would agree that it's better for a man to be employed even if his capacity is such as uh, to limit his uh, income. And uh, we take the position that it's far better to have thousands of these folks who are practically unemployable earning some money, doing some productive work for at least a few days in the year. This is an American story that begins in Florida and ends in New Jersey and New York State with the harvest. It is a 1960 Grapes of Wrath that begins at the Mexican border in California and ends in Oregon and Washington. It is the story of men and women and children who work 136 days of the year and average $900 a year. They travel in buses. They ride trucks. They follow the sun. Well, I don't know. It don't look like we'll ever get ahead. I guess we'll just have to keep going until we can find something better. A minister named Cassidy, who works with them, says... They are just as bad as the slaves. Only on name they are not a slave, but in the way they are treated, they are worse than slaves. And somebody has to make a thousands of dollars out of his sweat. Is that a slave or not? They are the migrants. Workers in the sweatshops of the soil, the harvest of shame. Brought to you tonight by Philip Morris Incorporated, makers of Marlboro, filter cigarette with the unfiltered taste. Now, Edward R. Murrow. This is CBS Reports. Harvest of shame. It has to do with the men, women, and children who harvest the crops in this country of ours, the best fed nation on earth. These are the forgotten people, the underprotected, the undereducated, the underclothed, the underfed. We present this report on Thanksgiving because were it not for the labor of the people you are going to meet, you might not starve but your table would not be laden with the luxuries that we have all come to regard as essentials. We should like you to meet some of your fellow citizens who harvest the food for the best fed nation on earth. Harvest of Shame is an appropriate title for it, but what's happened from 1960 to 2020, that's 60 years time. Six years after Edward R. Murrow's report, agricultural laborers still face many of the same forms of exploitation. And while the economy, agricultural economy, is good for foodies, the bad working conditions for farm workers have not improved. The COVID-19 pandemic has underscored the need for drastic reform in this realm once again. Beyond new forms of human exploitation, modern agriculture has led to a striking ecological imbalance globally. Schematically, this can be represented by the ratio between cultivated crops, wild species, and human populations in their numbers. This is not a historically accurate indication of proportions, but it's an indication of what's increased and what's decreased. Human populations have increased. Wild populations represented here by the tree have decreased in proportion to the human populations and the grain harvest per capita has declined as well in reference to the massive growth in relative terms of the human population. Now we must remember that the trophic structure, structure of an ecosystem is absolutely important. In the long run, it's determinative of what will happen to the human population. Humans do not photosynthesize. They depend upon either wild species or cultivated species to keep themselves alive. So ratios really matter. And the trends that are underway from the late 
20th century through to the early 21st century are just not sustainable. So beyond new forms of human exploitation, which we've seen in, in the COVID-19 exploitation of migrant workers, modern agriculture has led to this striking ecological imbalance that we have to keep in mind. In fact, we can begin to ask about overload. But answering questions will inevitably raise further, perhaps embarrassing or revealing questions about ratios. Are there too many people in reference to a sustainable food supply? Some have already argued that there are too many humans currently alive and about to live for the planet to sustain them. What's more revealing is the way in which the increase in the number of humans has brought about the rapid and accelerated degradation of ecosystems. Part of the problem comes from transforming the ratios between wild species, represented here by the forest or tree, the cultivated species, the stock of wheat, and ourselves. As far back as 15 years ago, the United Nations conducted an ecosystem assessment report. And it was the latest and loudest warning signal from the environmental science ever to be issued at the time, 15 years ago. It's worth listening to it and listening to the reports about it, which the BBC captured the planet more in the last half a century than at any time in history. Vast tracts of land have been taken for modern farming. Fertilizer use has increased hugely. Forests and other ecosystems are disappearing. None of this is a surprise, but what the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment aims to do is to measure what these environmental changes mean for human progress. It concludes that in places, too much water is being used for irrigation, so there's less available for drinking. Land that's farmed too intensively is becoming barren. Deforestation is increasing the risk of diseases such as malaria and cholera. The report also tries to put an economic cost on environmental degradation. In the UK, it finds farming causes around one and a half billion pounds worth of damage each year through impacts like greenhouse gas emissions, water pollution and soil erosion. Launched four years ago by UN Secretary General Kofi Annan, the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment is one of the biggest scientific collaborations ever undertaken. More than two and a half thousand pages long, the report is unlikely to produce any quick fix solutions, but it should provide the best view yet of the problem. Richard Black, BBC News. But that warning from the scientist has largely gone unheeded. Why has the human community sidestepped or ignored the population problem in reference to the environment. Well, many would argue that it's because of our fanciful understanding of the ecosystem. That is very dangerous. It's led in part because of the remarkable breakthroughs in agricultural technology led by Norman Borlaug. He died at age 95 in 2009, but many of his followers have continued his outlook and campaign for the growth of agriculture, which he started. You can listen to some of the great assessments of him uh, through various news media and through the BBC itself. It's very instructive. He was given the highest honor civilians can receive by President Bush. And he argued that population growth requires a second green revolution, not just the green revolution he participated in, but what he called the gene revolution, genetically modified organisms 
keep larger and larger populations of humans alive. He won the Nobel Peace Prize for his contribution. Significantly, it was not a science prize, but a peace prize because of the ways in which his technologies were replicated and used to feed tens of millions of people. Obviously, if you look at human population growth over a long period of time, it looks very much like a J-shaped pattern. A long drum roll of history leading to basically the 19th century when things started to expand enormously. This is regarded by many people as a matter of significant applause uh, because this is where people regard the takeoff of the human population in the industrial era. But it can equally be portrayed as a long drum roll to be followed by an explosion. In fact, that's the way it was often talked about in the 1960s, the population bomb and the population explosion. Okay, we can consider the long drum roll, but how do we assess what's happened here? Well, the first thing we can say about it is that it's never happened before in such a short period of time, and it will never happen again in such a short period of time. And we can ask, was the Green Revolution a success? Was the Green Revolution a good idea? Well, that depends upon how you look at the whole system of life on Earth. Basically, when you take into account long-term climate change, and the history of soils, you begin to realize that the global food system and agriculture are entirely dependent upon these other external phenomena, things that we thought were external, but in fact, which are absolutely internal and required for a functioning ecosystem to support human beings. There are, in fact, limits to the global food system and to agriculture that are imposed by soils and climate. These are limits we have to start now to pay attention to very, very carefully because we're approaching or exceeding them already. This was clearly demonstrated to the modern world by a group of MIT scientists who issued a report to the Club of Rome in 1972 entitled Limits to Growth. You can see the problem very dramatically if you look at the history of global population since about 1945. Human population has tripled in the period corresponding to the lifetime of one individual. Never has this happened before in human history and it will not happen again. In the lifetime of one individual, the entire global population tripled. Richard Manning summed up both the achievement and the limitations of this achievement, which is often called the Borlaug approach to agriculture. Let's have a listen. We faced an enormous crisis a generation ago, the early 1950s, 1960s, and for a reason. It was the first shift in the, ultra, in the fundamental strategy of agriculture that had occurred in 10,000 years. Agriculture, because it's catastrophic, must constantly have new land. It must constantly new, have new land because it also creates excess population and those people need a place to go. So, from the beginning of domestication of wheat 10,000 years ago in the Middle East, what is now Iraq, on, ironically enough, to about 1960, agriculture had a single strategy, 
which was it compensated for its weaknesses by taking new land. In 1960, we ran out of new land, period. There was no more, essentially. And we've, yes, we've colonized some new land since 1960, but we've lost an equal amount of things like salinization, loss of water. So basically, our arable land base, our farmable land base, is the same as it was today as in 1960. At the same time, we were faced with a period of enormous population growth. We were at 3 billion people then. And a lot of real smart people were looking at those numbers and saying, we're going to see famine within our lifetime, massive, widespread, die-off famine. Paul Ehrlich, the biologist, was among those people and probably the most famous of the people to do that. And his predictions never came to pass. It's not because his numbers were wrong, they were right. What he didn't understand at the time was a revolution that was brewing in the background. It was called the Green Revolution. A fellow named Norman Borlaug, financed by Rockefeller Foundation money, was learning a trick that created a new strategy for agriculture. And while we call it the Green Revolution and call it pesticides and fertilizer and a number of other things, it was something quite simple, much simpler than all those things. It was short plants. By dwarfing both wheat and rice, he was able to create a plant that increased its harvest index, that is its primary productivity. More of that productivity was dedicated to seed as opposed to leaves and stem. But also because of that short architecture, they were able to hype that plant with chemical fertilizers and water so it would support a heavier seed head. The result was a tripling of production, at least a tripling of production, of both rice and wheat. As a result of that, something like 75% of human nutrition today is covered by corn, wheat, and rice, three grains. The ultimate result of that was we were able to increase human population, support that extra population, plus ramp it up further. So, in my lifetime, human population has doubled from three to six billion people. The hidden fact in all of that was that all of that increased production depended not just on short plants, but on energy, fossil fuels. Because the chemical fertilizers that took advantage of that short plant architecture come from natural gas. It convert, it's a straight off conversion, natural gas into fertilizer, but at the same time, we're using enormous amounts of energy to plow that, the field with tractors, to process the food, because grain can be eaten straight up. You can't go out and eat a piece of grain like you can a green bean or a tomato. It must be processed in some way. It must be cooked. And to transport that energy, because we have a globalized, centralized system, then there must be an enormous amount of transport. As a result of that, all that is that if we take a look at about 1940 and an American farmer, that farmer was using roughly a calorie of fossil fuel to make a calorie of food. Today, that same farmer uses something like 10 calories of fossil fuel to make a calorie of food. That means that petrochemicals, fossil fuel, have become embedded in our food supply. We put off the catastrophe that occurred a generation ago with fossil fuels. In other words, we didn't colonize new farmlands, we colonized new oil fields and new watersheds to make irrigation water. If we run out of fossil fuel, that strategy will collapse in a heartbeat. And we will be at exactly the position we were a generation ago when we had three billion people we couldn't feed only now we have six billion people, exactly double the number. Norman Borlaug addressed the food problem, but we have come to understand that this is only part of the food population problem. And that, in turn, is only part of the food population environment problem. This requires a paradigm shift if we're going to understand the larger context of the food system. The question is, will the students and the followers of Norman Borlaug be able to make the paradigm shift 
to sustainable agriculture that is now required for our collective human survival. If they cannot make this needed paradigm shift, if we cannot collectively make that shift, then we can expect some very rude and costly disruptions in the global food system in the relatively near future. Distinguished scientists have warned us this problem for decades, indeed for centuries. There have been prophets who've warned us of this impending disaster, of course. One of the first was Thomas Malthus. His most important book, an essay of the principle of population was published over 200 years ago in 1798. In it, he argued that the human population would increase inexorably until it was halted by what he called misery and vice. Today, for some reason, that prophecy seems to be largely ignored or at any rate disregarded. It's true that he did not foresee the so-called green revolution, which greatly increased the amount of food that can be produced in any given area of arable land. And there may be other advances in our food producing skills that we ourselves still can't foresee. But such advances only delay things. The fundamental truth that Malthus proclaimed remains the truth. There cannot be more people on this earth than can be fed. Many people would like to deny that this is so. They would like to believe in that oxymoron, sustainable growth. Kenneth Boulding, President Kennedy's environmental advisor 45 years ago, said something about this. Anyone who believes in indefinite growth in anything physical, on a physically finite planet, he said, is either mad or an economist. <laughs> what have we learned from this global virus about the future of food, food systems, and the human prospect in a post-COVID world? If nothing else, we should have learned to be very wary of syndromes of exponential growth. Whether the syndrome involves the exponential growth of viruses, which can overtake the world in a matter of weeks, or whether the syndrome assumes the exponential growth of human economies and populations. In fact, it has been economists themselves who have emphasized this danger. As former chief economist at the World Bank, Herman Daly wrote a famous letter of resignation from the bank, pointing to the fatal mistake of the economies of continuous growth. He later wrote it up as a book called Beyond Growth, plain for all to see. Over his entire career, Herman Daly drew attention to an economics embedded in ecological reality, famously emphasizing that the economic system is a subset of the ecosystem not the other way around. In one book after another, initially steady state economics, he made this point. Then he went on to help found a whole group on ecological economics, trying to derive a rational economics based on how ecosystems work. He then outlined for everyone how to move beyond an economic growth, pointing out that growth itself can become very uneconomic when it becomes destructive of the basic fundamental life support system. Finally, well, he's been included in one anthology after another, including anthologies of environmental ethics, like this one called Earth Care. And the reason for it is his insights have not been transcended. In fact, they've been amplified. Around the world, others have affirmed this simple truth that economies are subsets of ecosystems. <laughs> 
Some have pointed to the rise and coming demise of free market fundamentalism for this reason. Particularly at Balliol College in Oxford. Balliol, you may recall, was the college in Oxford that Adam Smith attended when he wrote his Wealth of Nations. Since then, distinguished scientists like Gus Speth and economists like Kate Rayworth have made this point over and over again. Oxford itself has broadcast this to the world. Infinite growth on a finite planet is not possible. A paradigm shift is now required <clears throat> for human survival. A business as usual strategy with growth economics will lead in the future, as it has in the past, to an ever in escalating pattern of overshoot and collapse. We need instead to move beyond growth economics to a sustainability paradigm. And that requires some study of the transition that will be necessary. So concerning food and food systems, we can sum up what we've learned pretty quickly in 10 easy points. Our global food system is the result of several successive waves of historical, technological, and political factors, determining its current characteristics and, unfortunately, its likely future evolution. These include its origins and evolution during the slave trade, European colonial rule, and post-colonial economic regimes, all aimed at maximizing production for export of cash crops in exchange for food staples. Local food systems, production systems, were generally neglected or ignored altogether. The global system has evolved through an ever greater dependence upon subsidies from fossil fuels in all aspects of their profile, their production, transportation, storage, and processing. Petrochemical agriculture has come to dominate the world food system, accounting for the great spurt in food production and human population growth since World War II. The human population has more than tripled since the end of World War II. Biotechnology firms, owned often by petrochemical firms, <clears throat> now dominate the production and distribution of large portions of the global agricultural activity. They have introduced GMOs, genetically modified organisms, on a widespread basis throughout the global system. Large-scale petrointensive agriculture is known to devastate biodiversity, on and off farm water supplies, and topsoil, the three essential components of any stable food system. Groundwater resources for agriculture are becoming ever more scarce <clears throat> at the same time <clears throat> that climate change is inducing sea level rise throughout the world. And new patterns of drought and severe weather <clears throat> often compromise expensive recent investments in installed irrigation infrastructure. As arable land becomes relatively ever more scarce, the world's poorest countries and the poorest populations within them have fallen victim to land grabbing operations from abroad. <coughs> Current practices of petrointensive agriculture linked through long distance trade are unsustainable for humanity in the future. In a post COVID world, humanity will have the opportunity to redress and correct <coughs> many of the vulnerable, fragile, and unsustainable aspects of our current global food system. <coughs> but this will not be either automatic nor easy. On the contrary, powerful corporate forces will oppose this. But clearly the expansion or simply the greening of industrial agriculture will not be sufficient 
to assure the human prospect for very much longer in our complex and ever evolving ecosystem. To assure the future of food, we must reconceive human food production within the constraints of a functioning global ecosystem on our finite planet, sustained all the while by the infinite throughput energy from the sun. If we do not understand this, we will not survive for much longer. Food matters. Biologists and ecologists have pointed this out for years. We may think we're a post-industrial civilization and we call ourselves a post-modern world. But there is no such thing as a post-agricultural society. Some biological fundamentals deserve to be re-emphasized. No organism, population, or species can outlive its life support system for long. No production system based on non-renewable resources can outlast the supply of those resources. Humans do not produce food. We depend upon plants that do. The unlimited growth of any population within a finite ecosystem is not possible. Can't happen, won't happen. Can't happen, won't happen. Can't happen, and it will not happen. <laughs>